All right, this is the material that's going to be uh, the basis for our quiz on Tuesday, and this is uh, the question for the quiz. And um, that's the question, uh, but then down here below, this will also be printed in the quiz too. So the quiz is going to look like this, and uh, you should add these things to help explain the question on the quiz. And to do that, you can look at this video, and uh, in Chapter 7 of your book, I think box 7C would be really good to look at and uh, ha help you kind of build out a better answer. And uh, then there are also a couple of sections in the book about flowering, and that would help it to look at too. But the focus is going to be really this uh, material uh, in this video. And uh, so this is from your book, and um, this shows a uh, Rabidopsis flower as a model flower. And uh, so there's going to be describing using Rabidopsis, it's going to describe any flower. And uh, so see it says, here's a flower, and if you take a cross-section of the flower like this, we're going to describe some parts of the flower. And the parts of the flower are in four circles, and the circles are called whorls. And so that's down here, and uh, so we have these four whorls in a flower, and they go from the outside to the inside. The first are the sepals, and the sepals are the uh, green material that would be covering the flower bud. And then as the, as the flower blossoms, the sepals get folded back and under down by the stem. Then the next whorl in the second whorl are the petals of the flower. And then the next whorl in is called the stamen, and those are the male parts of a flower. And then the central whorl is called the carpal, and that's the female part of the flower where the seed is going to develop. And uh, I created this image, um, so we're going to just use those terms that I just defined. Uh, here's some other terms that you may have seen in other biology classes, uh, you know, like maybe in high school or a botany class. So these are the parts, the four whorls are the sepal, the petals, the stamen, and the carpal, and those are the terms that developmental biologists and we're going to use, uh, uh, use, and that's what we're going to use. So it's a side view of that same image, and so we'll use these ideas here. And so again, we've got these four circles. Four whorls, one, two, three, four. Sepal, petal, carpal, stamen, like that, stamen, carpal. Okay, so then here's the next thing, and that is that uh, this is a figure from your book, and I put this at the bottom of that figure. So it's color-coded, and uh, see what this is diagramming, what the author is diagramming is there's a cascade of gene expression leading from um, the start of flowering, so that would be this vegetative to floral transition. And so up here at the top, top is going to, are going to be genes like leafy. Uh, and these are, several of these are transcription factors. You're going to regulate transcription of genes in the transcription factors expressed in the apical meristem initials. So those stem cells that are forming the plant are going to express these genes and it's a cascade of gene expression uh, that's going to go from here down to here. And so these are going to be the functional output. So these genes products here, for example, are important. Say this a petal of one is important setting up the sepal. So it's all color-coded and it's a cascade of gene expression setting up these four whorls. All right, then the next thing to mention is that um, one of the take-home messages is this looks a lot like uh, in fruit flies. We talked about uh, bicoid and maternal factors in the germ line stem cell at the tip of the ovary leading to a cascade of gene expression, the gap genes, the parallel gap genes, and the parallel genes, down to the 
Fox genes. And this is a very comfortable notion where we're going to set up a pattern based on expression of some homeotic genes. So these are all homeotic genes. And um, the, uh, the story is very similar. There are homeotic genes here that set up the pattern, the anterior-posterior axis. And so it's a really similar pattern, and uh, we emphasized this before, but these are, when we compare these, these are not orthologs. So it's a similar story. It's a similar story, but not because of evolutionary relationships. It's a similar story because somehow this is a good plan, and it evolved a couple of times. And uh, so these are homeotic genes here, and the thrust of the question is to explain how uh, the uh, genetic analysis of these genes explained this pattern. And um, the, uh, the pattern is going to be that um, overlying these four whorls, we're going to see there are uh, so there's a, a pattern of gene expression that is going to be there's going to be three regions or addresses of gene expression, and that's called the A B C model. So we're going to be explaining the genetic analysis of these genes uh, in order to explain this um, the organization of these four wheels. Okay, so that being said, one of the reasons that we talk about this is this idea of seeing this cascaded gene expression and see that commonality. It's just a really interesting thing to see plants and animals have this similar feature. Then here's the other region that scientists uh, would include this in an introductory developmental biology is because once these homeotic genes have been identified, they can be used to study the diversity of flowers. So there are a lot of different flowers, but it turns out that even though these are very, very different, they're still based on this architecture of these four worlds and this ABC model and this set. In this case, these are all plants, and so these are orthologs of these homeotic genes. And when we want to, you know, in modern developmental biology, when botanists are comparing flowers, what they now compare is they look specifically at the gene expression of these homeotic genes in order to understand the diversity of flowers. And that's a really important concept, and we will see that in, in animals too. That once the genes regulating something like flowering are identified, if you want to study flowers and the diversity of flowers, let's look at those homeotic mutations and the homeotic genes to see how evolution has tweaked flowers uh, by uh, having mutations in these regulatory pathways. Great. All right, and this is just an image to show this idea of uh, these orthologs, the idea that these are orthologs, and we know all about that. So we can go between flowering plant species, and we can find orthologs, and we say, hey, how has this ortholog changed during evolution to give rise to some of the diversity that we see in modern uh, flowering plants? Uh, okay, and so here are some of the genetic analyses that you're going to want to use in the answer to your question. And what's going on here is that scientists started out just finding some curious mutations. And so here's the phenotype of a mutation in one gene. And the phenotype is a homeotic transformation. So this has, uh, this has no uh, sepals and no petals. This flower has no sepals and no petals. It lacks the first two whorls. But they haven't been really been lost. Instead, they've been, they've been replaced by extra stamen and carpal. So remember that in the fruit fly, the antenna on the fruit fly's head got replaced by a leg. And so we wouldn't say that we really lost the antenna. We had a homeotic transformation where the antenna was replaced by a leg. So same thing here. We haven't really lost the sepal and petals, but we've replaced them 
with um, these other two um, addresses. And you can think about it that way, like we have these address, address number three and number four, and we replaced address one and two with three and four. This apetalid 2 gene is the gene that's mutant in this case, and apetalid 2 must have something to do with giving the address of worlds 1 and 2. And this just shows, this is just showing the entire circle of worlds, so that's why it's depicted that way, just to try to help give you a perspective on what's going on here. We've got the four worlds depicted this way, and the author uses this image again and again. So here's another mutation, and again, these mutations were found quite a few years ago, and scientists were curious about them. They gave hints of how flowers were organized, and, um, uh, and um, this is the modern understanding of how they're organized. So here, what's happening is a homeotic transformation because of one uh, gene uh, that's mutant, and what happens here is that we lose the uh, stamen and the petals. So we have a homeotic transformation and we um, uh, lose uh, whorls 2 and 3, like that. And so when a petal 3 is lost, when we have a loss of function allele of a petal 3, we lose these um, addresses. And so see, we're losing pairs of addresses. We're losing pairs of addresses. And then here's another example, and here we lose the stamen and the carpal. So worlds three and four are lost. And lots of, or a number of different mutations like this were found in plants. Uh, they're pretty interesting to see. This has extra petals and sepals in the center of the flower. And uh, scientists uh, uh, accumulated a variety of mutations and they went on to build a model. And the model looks like this. That... Um, if you look up here, there are, in the wild type, three uh, uh, functions, and uh, they are given by genes. There are more than three genes, so there are these three functions, and you could think of them a little bit like the address number on a house. And we're going to make combinations of these addresses. The three functions are provided by more than three genes because the genes are both activators and repressors uh, of this um, story. The genes involved are transcription factors. and their homeotic genes. So when they're mutant and lost, the transcription factor is lost, and we get different addresses. And here's the ABC model that shows that and to create these four worlds, there are these three overlapping region, regions of, of gene function, gene expression. And uh, so sepals are, cr are created in a place where we have the A function, and then petals where we have both the A and B function, and then stamens where we have the uh, B and C function, and then uh, carpals where we just have the C function. And the idea is that uh, all the homeotic mutations were explained by that. So you could lose A function like that, C function like that, and uh, create homeotic transformations. Uh, and here are some examples that are shown there. And so that's the basis of the model, and um, you can take a look at some of the images in the book to help you understand that. Uh, that's the bottom line, and we want to build out from that your explanation in the quiz about, again, the significance of it. It helps us understand the diversity of modern flowers. It helps us draw parallels with uh, animal developmental biology that is really significant. And uh, these are the this is the genetic evidence for that. Uh, here is some uh, images from uh, box 7C. Uh, that'd be good to look at just to get a, a better understanding of these. And, and you can s step through the logic here to create this A, B, C model that goes on to create uh, positions of these four worlds. Um, here's a, just a drawing from the book that just shows that idea. So again, where this, this you want to be familiar with this scheme the author uses for drawing the four worlds 
and the ABC model. And so this is just looking down at a flower, and it's just saying, yeah, here's the flower, and the flower has these four whirls, kind of like a bullseye, uh, with the carpels at the center of the bullseye. This is just some uh, evidence uh, for gene expression, just showing that here is a floral uh, meristem that, and it's just showing that genes are expressed in these different regions, the A, B, C region, like that. And uh, just showing some evidence, these would be wild type expression of the proteins from these homeotic genes. Um, this is something you looked at, can you can take a look at uh, just to kind of quiz yourself about your understanding of the patterns the, um, that give rise to the phenotypes in these homeotic mutants. And uh, so I just got this off the web to just use as an app to see if, you, if it makes sense to you about the loss of uh, one or more of these A, B, or C functions like that. So you can take a look at that. And then back to this drawing again, um, it's from your book. And the idea is we start out and we go through this vegetative to reproductive transition and that transition leads to the activation of these, these genes. And so it, uh, it's interesting just to kind of understand that this goes hand in hand. When you say, oh, we're going to switch and make a flower, the way you make a flower is by activating this set of genes. And as this meristem grows, now a flower is formed. And uh, so there's that image again that I made about uh, the four worlds of the flower. And uh, this just shows that uh, to emphasize, there's just a real big diversity of flower types. And um, some flowers are old, uh, representative as old in evolutionary time scale, and uh, will have sort of a reduced story. This is kind of a modern flower story. And so in some cases, they might have, uh, uh, not, they might not have, uh, say a sepal. So I'm going to say that I think that lilies lack a sepal. In other cases, uh, what we consider to be petals are sometimes uh, actually sepals, and it's not that there's been a homeotic transformation, it's just that what we see as a flower, we sometimes mislabel. So in like Christmas poinsettias, the big red leaves are actually the sepals. And uh, like I said, one of the reasons that we want to look at this is because now scientists use this model and the orthologs of these uh, regulatory genes to understand the diversity of flowers and the evolution of uh, this uh, diverse flowers that we see on our planet. Here's a really good example of that. So here we're going in the evolution, we're going uh, for uh, evolution in uh, selective plant breeding from the original wild rose to the modern garden rose. And in that... Um, Selective plant breeding, there was evolutionary change that occurred to get to the um, modern rose and um, the, uh, the, um, that included several changes and one of them was that there was a homeotic transformation of some of the stamen, whorl 3, into petals. So we see a reduction of stamen number and an increase in petal number. And in this case, it wasn't a complete transformation, but a partial transformation. So that's important because the modern garden rose is still fertile. It still has some stamen tucked in there, but we had this dramatic transformation. And there's just a, that's a really vivid explanation uh, or example that you can be aware of forever. Yay. Uh, and then uh, another topic that we want to talk about in this um, video just briefly is this idea of this vegetative to reproductive transition. So at the very start of the story we have this vegetative to reproductive transition and we want to begin our story with that, that we're going to activate leafy expression in the uh, apical meristem. We're going to activate it uh, by a signal that's going to come from the leaves. And I'm just going to briefly mention that idea, and we talked about it briefly in class, but I want to cover this a little bit. There's a figure from your book 
is a little bit of a complicated figure, uh, even though it's a simple drawing. So in this upper part, it's showing one thing, and it's showing that uh, Rabidopsis flower, so this plant, model plant, Rabidopsis, flowers early in response to long days. And see, that's represented here. It just makes a few leaves, and then boom, it makes a, fl it makes a flower. Uh, in short days, it makes more leaves, and then it makes a flower. So long days stimulates flowering, and those long days are detected in the leaves, and then that signal is sent to the uh, meristem to trigger that vegetative reproductive uh, transition. This is a significant thing because in short days, the plant will still flower, so it's still fertile, uh, and you can, you can have mutations in this pathway, but the mutations are not uh, lethal because the plant's still fertile. It will flower. It'll just take a little bit longer for it to flower. And that, so this was a powerful way to study this um, genetically. And uh, down here, this is a really different story. Uh, and this is just showing something we talked about in class already, which is that if you misexpress... wild type leafy, so the good leafy uh, gene uh, transcription unit and, and protein, you misexpress it, you'll get uh, a precocious production of flowers, either in long day or short day plants. And this is just showing this idea that's in a really important concept in this course, and that is to misexpress Wild type leafy, we get this precocious, premature production of flowers. And uh, the um, book covers this idea of uh, the timing of flowering, and it uh, just briefly describes that in the flower, in the leaf, there's a gene called constans, constans, and constans is. Um, uh, expressed in during the light and degraded in the dark. And this image is just showing that in short days the light's uh, on and uh, constant gets produced, but it gets dark before much constant is made and the constant protein is degraded. In long days, the light is uh, long enough, the day is long enough, that constant protein accumulates, and constant activates a gene called FT, that's uh, one of its um, targets that we focused on in class, and FT mRNA goes to the meristem. So F M FT M mRNA, maybe protein, heads the meristem to activate um, leafy and other target genes in the meristem to create a flower. So we can start our flower formation story here, where in Arabidopsis, long days allow for the accumulation of constant protein, and that activates FT, and FT uh, stimulates the meristem to go through this vegetative to reproductive transition. And that's just this image from your book showing that idea, that there's the start of the flowering transition. And uh, there's a lot more uh, to say about that. This is just a figure from a web review, and it's showing there's FT, and there's constants activating FT, and there uh, is the circadian clock regulating constants production, and then there here's FT heading up to the leaf to promote flowering. And uh, there's just a lot of stuff happening in the leaf. Here's just one other thing I'll mention, and that is that uh, the temperature also affects the timing of flowering. And uh, here is a gene called FLAC that is regulating FT and provides another input. And this is um, temperature. And Rabidopsis needs to get cold, uh, needs to get cold to shut off FT. Uh, flack, and that that is a process that 
uh, you may have heard of, it's a pretty common term called vernalization. So that's happening also in the leaf. And it's um, um, targeting this FT gene expression. So constants is in long days activating um, the um, FT uh, transcription and FLAC will be repressing it unless FLAC's gotten shut off by cold temperatures. And that's it. Um, and here's just a uh, final figure uh, just showing this idea of the reproductive to the vegetative to reproductive transition. And that's that. And we'll have a quiz on it on Tuesday.